everybody. Welcome to the Contracts 101 seminar for Drama and Skills. For those of you who don't know me, I am Terry Stratton, Director of Education and Outreach here at the Guild. I'd like to welcome you to this last seminar for this season. Um, gearing up to start planning seminars beginning in the fall. And as always, if you have ideas about people you'd like to see on panels, if there are contracts that you'd like to hear explained by our wonderful business affairs department, Feel free to email me and I'll be happy to help you. My email address is on the back of your program. Uh, normally I would tell you to turn your phones off, but actually I'm going to have you keep them on today for this event. <laughs> but at least put them on vibrate. That would be very helpful. But make sure you check in on Facebook and tweet and tell everybody that you're here. That would be great. Uh, and you can also tell all your friends to watch this event starting tomorrow on livestream.com. And the channel is New Play TV. So you'll be able to watch tomorrow, starting tomorrow, um, and, you know, be how you look, I guess, if you all stand up and stand in front of the camera. <laughs> uh, the panel will talk for about an hour, and then they'll open up the floor for questions. I ask that when you ask a question, please make sure you ask it loud enough that our online audience can hear it as well. So, oh, there's a question already. Yes. There's a question already. No. But then I'll be in for the end of the event. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our executive, Assistant Executive Director of Business Affairs, Associate Executive Director of Business Affairs, also known as a rock star, David Carlson. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to, to introduce this panel tonight. This is the first panel that our uh, Associate, uh, our Director of Business Affairs, Deborah Murad, uh, is chairing, and she joined the Guild last September to help us handle all the members' problems, uh, if you have any contract issues, any questions you have about the law pertaining to the rights of publicity, defamation, rights of privacy, uh, collaboration, joint authorship, anything like that, Deborah is, is I will say, you know, she came in with a, a lot of heart, and she has the two things that I require to like any attorney, and, and attorneys are hard to like. <laughs> So I've, I've, I've boiled it down to two, two qualities, that, it's that she's, she's super competent and she really cares. She cares about her job, she cares about you guys. Uh, she went to uh, Barnard and she's now, she's been with us since September. So that's my introduction to Deborah. Uh, starting at the other end of the table, we have Mark Merriman, who's a, who's a partner at the entertainment, with, within the entertainment group uh, of uh, Frankfurt Turnick. Uh, he, uh, is, he represents creatives theater and film, and he was production counsel on a number of shows that you've, you've probably heard of, the recent uh, production of Once that came over from London, and Glass Menagerie, uh, and to his left, uh, he's also an adjunct professor at Stilton Law School, my, my law school, uh, for entertainment law. Uh, Adam Simquist is to his left. Adam, uh, Adam's play you may have heard of, Clown Therapy, which has done very well. Clown and Bar. What's that? Clown Bar. It's a bar on Clown Bar. <laughs> <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> and he has a he has a, a, a very well respected blog called I Interview Playwrights. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he would say, why is it, why do you say it's so why do you say it's so well well uh, you know has a good reputation? I said, well, it, it seems to be a lot of people read it. And he said, oh no, uh, we we discovered that he was comparing his blog to something like a blog from Justin Bieber. <laughs> I was comparing his blog to a blog of other playwright interviews, other, other blogs in the <laughs> theater industry. <laughs> so it's all relative. To his left, we have Max Grossman, who's an agent at Avery Vardis Agency. Before that, he was creative executive at Scott Rubin Productions. Uh, to his left, we have Seth Cotterman. Seth is the director of social media, manager of social media, or director? I'll take whatever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's the... Uh, he's the uh, the king of social media <laughs> here at the Comedy Guild. And uh, he's, he's 
so good at his job that one day he was he was spouting all this advice to somebody, uh, and I and I told him afterwards. I said, "Don't don't give away all the all the great information. It could be like trade secrets." And he was like, "No, that's my job. You guys <laughs> tons more than I do." Uh, and then to his left is is uh, Bobby Lopez, co-author of Avenue Q, and uh, and the Book of Mormon. His reputation precedes him. Uh, uh, I don't think he'd be surprised if the F uh, if the F bomb gets dropped tonight. I don't know. Uh, but, but very, very well. So this is our panel tonight, and Deborah, I'll hand it over. Okay, I just Sorry. wanted. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yay! <laughs> um, so I think, as as an attorney, I think one of the most exciting parts of of social media is to see how the lives progress so quickly, and we have to react and create new laws so quickly. And so too do do authors have to react to the social media and, and the new platforms that are coming up all the time. So the goal of tonight's program is to, one, teach those of our members who might not be using any sort of social media right now how to go about that um, if they choose to and why that might be helpful to them. And also to talk a little bit to for, for those who are using social media, how they could better tweak what they're doing to, to, to really maximize the benefits. And of course, because we are the Business Affairs Department, we want to talk a little bit about the pitfalls, some of the liability, some of the legal aspects um, that are there. I think that the internet tends to be this, it tends to feel like an open forum where you can take and share everything, and we have to be careful because there are copyright laws and there are certainly certain things that we need to be aware of. So, just to start, our, to our wonderful panelists, why use social media? What are the advantages? And, and maybe, I don't know, Bobby, you want to start us off and, and tell us why you use social media? Well, I, I can give a story. Um, yesterday I tweeted that I, I was going to be coming to the panel, um, and Seth actually tweeted back, actually, that panel's tomorrow night. <laughs> and um, I like tweeted back, social media and accidents. See, I would not have known that. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm on Twitter. I'm on um, Facebook. I don't really use it so much for, I mean, I suppose it's all publicity because you're kind of interacting with fans and you're getting your name out there every time you you um, blast something. But um, I don't feel like I ever use it um, to directly promote myself. But I, 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 I'm kind of here to learn. I would like to find out more um, <laughs> More stuff I could I could be using it for. And Adam, how do you feel about that? How do you feel that we use social media? What what for? What are the advantages? What are the advantages? Um, I mean, I I think um, yeah, it's a public kind of a show uh, to find out information from other writers, from other um, people in the industry, um, to learn things, mm -hmm. <laughs> to find out about the process that needs to lead to our success. Mm -hmm. Which would exactly, yes. I'm not online right now. It's, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> uh, well, you mentioned, you mentioned Twitter, and I just want to mention, because I, I neglected to do so, that we're actually going to be on Twitter tonight, and Seth is going to be uh, at, mm. I suppose, say, hashtag new play. So you can write in for anyone that ends up watching this and, and post your comments, and Seth will also tell us if anyone has anything pressing to say. That's right. But, <laughs> but in addition to Twitter, what are some of the other programs that, that you feel are, are – pretty invaluable. Anyone? Well, I mean, I, I think like the, the big ones are obviously Twitter and Facebook and those are kind of the, that's like, that's where the people are. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a writer, that's kind of, that's kind of the goal, right? You, you want to meet people, you want to kind of tie up loose ends and put your name out there. So I think going where the people are is important. So Facebook, Twitter, I, I, I think eventually we'll get into like talking about blogs and websites and that kind of stuff. But I think, I don't know, I think the, the big ones, Twitter and Facebook, and then if you feel fancy and free and want to try, like, Instagram or Pinterest. and Those are for younger people. <laughs> <laughs> the well, there you go. <laughs> well, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of creating a website and blogs and all this, are you, is the goal to create a package or is the goal just let's get my name out there? And maybe it depends on what, what level you're talking about. If uh, anyone wants to speak to that. You know, I, I think that, I think that the, what you typically do for people that are starting out into social media is you want to do everything like all at once. And, and I think that you get really burnt out and really exhausted.
exhausted if you go about it with that that train of thought. Is like, here's what I this is like what I typically would think of you. And please say I'm wrong if, if you want to make a conversation about this. It's like you should have a, a home base. You should have a place that like you house you know where your works are. Uh, more information about you. Um, that kind of stuff. You should have a, a place where all of that can be found. And then from that, you kind of build like your relationship kind of things, like Twitter and Facebook. You, you kind of go out from there. And maybe, maybe, your, maybe your home base is a website. Maybe it's a blog. Maybe your, your home base is a fan page on Facebook. But I think that you have to have somewhere where everything is kind of collected and then go out from there. Do you, do you guys you have know, that? I don't have a website. I need a website. That's one of the things I've been like meaning to do for the last 10 years. It's possible that you don't need a website, Greg. Like, <laughs> I'd like to have one. I, Everyone you know. sort of knows who you are, though. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, I, it, maybe, maybe my life could be better. I think I think that just to interject one thing about a website. I mean, the the, the, the client side you are dealing with things that are real problems. Like if you have your own website, there are costs involved, right? Like you have to register the domain. You have to. That implies that you have something that you have to police in terms of if someone is ripping off your website and using a website with a similar name, redirecting traffic. There are legal issues with it, and it's just sort of like doing business issues. So that's something that people take into consideration, even if it's just a matter of I have to pay a couple hundred dollars to register the website. That's that's real money, and you sort of could focus your money elsewhere. And I think what a lot of people are finding about websites is they consider them mm -hmm. static. They consider them a bit like going to the public library. They're a bit it isn't what people want because we tend to embrace as a poster getting information quickly. That we, we, you know, our advertisers have done their job in that we see something that looks like a bottle of Clorox bleach, that's bleach. Like that's what we want and it's a quick sensation. So I think what people are finding more and more is that Facebook and Twitter are essentially free. Or they're the cost of you, you know, having your own wireless at home or going to Starbucks and borrowing someone else's for a while. And I think that fast gratification is what people are tend to gravitating toward because it's cheaper, it's free, and they know that's kind of the widest audience they can get. It's easier for someone to retweet someone than to sit back and send an email saying, oh, my friend just did this website. I'm kind of in that cusp of like, you know, older and younger, so I tend to go to websites still, but I do know that I get the fastest information and probably respond best to tweets or a Facebook page or something else. And they're, they're all they're all what you make them, right? If you have a website, you can direct people to your website on Twitter. You can direct people to your website on Facebook. There are some issues with that, but there's ways to do it. And I think it just becomes a personal, like, what's my financial reality? And the other thing about a website is you constantly want to be updated. Because to update a website, it's not the same as you know updating a Facebook page. You have to actually go back into it, or if you have a website designer, pay that person to go back yeah. into it. So if you're a creative person, I feel like the bulk of what you're doing is saying, you don't so much rest on your laurels, right? Like it's this is what this is what is new and active that I'm working on. So that's I'm sort of straying from the legal aspect, but I think that's sort of the sense of what I'm getting at least from the clients. I, I have both. I have a I have a blog and I have a website, and the website I do absolutely. Pay which is very clear, um, and very easy to navigate, which is, I mean, part of, part is partially just like accumulating links over time, and time is just, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard for people to, to figure stuff out that way. I think it's, a lot of it depends on the tool, you know, depending on what kind of presence you have now on the internet. Um, something like Facebook, you're able to kind of drive traffic, so the idea of being that you're connecting with other people, and you're sending messages to other people, it's much more interactive versus a website where I feel like it's kind of the basic information. You know, here are your plays that I've written. Here's how you can get in touch with me. Here's a headshot if you feel like doing that. And that's basically it. You know, I, when I was working in the production office, if I needed to find out who somebody was, I wasn't necessarily going to go to a Facebook page. I'd go to their website. Kind of move to Google, pops up. I can't get too much information that way, so you're protected, but it's look if you want to reach out to me, here I am. And meanwhile, if you have plays going on, if you want to kind of give yourself a bit of a little bit of publicity, that's where something more geared towards social networking would come in, where you don't have to worry about driving traffic to your website, it's kind of just a holding place for your information. And you can use all the other tools
ju och så kan man svara på sen det som man kan tycka är att det här låter bra. So I think I hear I, I hear a lot about reaching out and getting that audience and getting people to listen to you. How do you do that? <laughs> how, how do you how do you create something worth listening to? Is the you know what is what is sort of your motivation then when you're when you're starting to create a blog or when you're you're putting your Facebook page together is you're trying to get people to to sort of listen. Or maybe Max, you could you could even tell us what would what would attract you? What would from even from that standpoint? I mean, in in the end, you know, in order to find out who people are, I would go to websites. You know, just to kind of basic information. If I hear about a place somewhere, if I uh, somebody says, oh, I saw something downtown that was fantastic, you really have to go. Then I would try and look the first thing. I'd go to their website. But initially, whoever told me about the show, or however I find out about the show, probably would have happened because somebody sent out a, an email, an e-blast. But through Facebook or through Twitter, you can actually kind of do that e-blast to a larger audience without having to go through your, you know, your contacts yeah. and say, here are the 20 people I know, and deliver an email. You'll probably have to send anybody to my friends. You can put it on Facebook as a message, and those, you know, your friends will see it. Then they can send it to their friends, and it kind of grows and expands. Um, in terms of the information, I think the place to start is if there is a production or if there is a reading or if there is something, some event that's happening where you can – it's not just about, you know, read my work, read my work. Mm -hmm. It's about, like, come be a part of what I'm doing um, and, and engage in the community in that way. Um, that's, I think, kind of the first step for me, maybe for me. Mm -hmm. There's, there's um, two, two um, examples I can point to in terms of musical theater writers that have used social media in a way that I find really impressive and I've paid attention to. Um, one was, um, I guess it was, like, five years ago, um, I knew this kid through um, my collaborator, Jeff Marks. He was um, friends with this kid, Benj Pasek. And, um, and I didn't know that much about him. Jeff was sort of uh, mentoring him, and, he was, and Benj was his um, assistant. And, um, and then out of nowhere, all of a sudden, Benj and his partner, Justin, had a big um, show at Joe's Pub. And I was just blown away that that happened. And the way it happened was Facebook. Because they had, um, they also went to the University of Michigan. They had a, a wide network of friends in the business. And through Facebook, they were able to get everyone in the industry, every single producer, every single writer and director that I had, uh, that I had met were at the show. And they were, these kids were 17, 18, or I guess maybe even 19. Um, but but that was like, that was, that was something I could only have possibly, you know, could only have dreamed of at that age um, that they got and they did it by by savvy use of, of Facebook and the other the other example that I um, live with every day is Lynn Manuel Miranda who um, just is constantly on Twitter and Facebook <laughs> <laughs> blasting away he's, he's just funny I mean I think that sort of that's my model like if you can be funny and entertaining just using using Twitter as a as a medium in and of itself um, that's a way to build up followers and kind of and kind of gain it's, a, it's just sort of a way of connecting daily to people, um, whether they're your fans or just people you know. And, and, so, and it te that you tend to get more and more followers, not less and less, if you do it all the time. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the thing about both of Bobby's examples, though, are you didn't have writers, like, tweeting and posting, like, I have this play, and come see this play and this play. I think that what they did was they found a community, and they talked. Right. And it kind of built out from there. So I, I think to think about it as promoting yourself may put you yeah. in the wrong mindset because it's not so much like, come see my show. You have to come read my work, do this. It's kind of about finding people that share similar interests or you know side hobbies or people that are also tweeting or posting about craft and their experience. And I think that it's, it's finding those communities and kind of building your place in. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that that... Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And also, I mean, you know... If I go see Bobby's show and I can be like, oh, I saw this great show, everyone needs to see it, you might not know about it, you know. Yeah, right. Right. Everyone, of course, knows about it. But <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I find that, um, that I'm able to interact with people. Um, it's, it's kind of like a, um, you put something out in the world and sometimes um, you just don't hear, uh, you're not there the night of, you're not there when the stuff gets heard or, you know, someone listens to your demo or whatever. And, um, and it's just it, being there, being on it is a way of staying connected and, and, and feeling like you are getting to 
talk back to fans and fans talk back to you if there's if there's in, in terms of the talk back though that's great if everything's positive what mm-hmm. what happens when it turns negative maybe mark you want to talk about some of the the issues that might come up in um, terms of responding to negative commentary when does that cross a legal line for you know, i mean i think the thing you know everybody needs to think about it, 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 it and i think it does go back to like you know there's that horrible line there's no such thing as bad publicity of course there is it's <laughs> awful it's awful to have someone say you know and, and i'm guilty of it too maybe i'll check in and see a show and just be like i wish i had the two hours of my life back my <laughs> life was ruined because of this experience <laughs> which, you know we've all had that experience but i think there's i think there's two levels one is that you know as as big as it feels in terms of the theater industry and the entertainment industry even within new york it is all about relationships. And relationships are a lot about respect and they're a lot about boundaries. So there's two levels to this. There's a scary legal level that I'll get to in a second because I think that's the thing that is probably easiest to avoid. Mm-hmm. But sort of decorum level, it just goes back to what you know what Bobby was saying, which is that you can be reciprocal people in terms of returning a favor. And I think you will find that that ability to build a relationship, even if it's just some weird social media site, that you went to see someone's show and you really liked it or you liked one part of it or you liked someone in it, you give them that favor, you give them that gift, you comment on their wall or you tweet about it or you check in on Foursquare with another tweeter, you do something that says, I'm a part of this community. If you don't like something, you don't write or contribute to people. Be better than you know a you know a New York Times or a Post reviewer. Be kind. <laughs> it, I, I sift through things and I often think, why am I here? But I will tell you something that at the end of everything I see, that I'm not just being fakey because I'm in a room full of creative people. There is something that I like about it, and I'm a firm believer that if you're able to find that thing and you're able to connect with that person who gave you that thing, they're going to return the favor in some way. So there's a free way, to, easy way to do it, right? The legal problem you get into is if you're suddenly lambasting something and you're personally attacking someone, and even if you don't cross the line to do something that is libelous, that, you know, this person is, is, did this and it's just an all-out lie because you were so outraged that it was such a terrible experience, even if you're not quite doing that, you don't want to be the person getting the letter from someone saying, you know, the, the person's lawyer saying, you've defamed my client looking for a million dollars, that they're never going to collect, but you don't need that because it all goes back to the first thing. You're suddenly that person mm-hmm. in this small industry. You don't want that. Be, you know, you're allowed to be honest. Honesty is a great thing, but you're part of a community. So the honesty has to be sort of the ability to help someone. You know, it's being honest to the point to say, like, I would have done it this way, or I'd like this, something simple, but it all comes back to that. That's the sort of dangerous thing and great thing about social media is that it it's there forever. People retweet it. People copy it. Look what this quote I said about my friend in play. Never deal with this. You know, that you don't want. But there's a way to do it. And what you don't want to do is be kind of the bottom of the barrel. Bad, bad, bad. It was terrible. And what you really don't want to do is to somehow find someone else's intellectual property, trademark, a song that's somewhere else, putting that on your site, and making a comment about it. Because you've got a possible copyright infringement problem or a trademark mm-hmm. infringement problem. And then you also have the defamation problem. And if you add them up, the claim letter gets longer. <laughs> your life gets shorter because it's so stressful to have to deal with these things. And you suddenly have to hire somebody like me that says, I do this and I take a $10,000 retainer before I start. So you, you just want to <laughs> sort of like <laughs> be a member of the good, you know. You want to be good citizens of this industry, I think, is a basic answer. Do you have a question? Yeah, you said we were weeping. Weeping is, what, what I would encourage you to do is, on any social networking site you're on, carefully read the terms of use. They will put you to sleep by the second paragraph, but carefully read them, because they're going to talk through things about their policies about link trees. Link trees are generally, as a legal matter, safe. The Copyright Act talks about an illegal act of copying. Link trees are... The, the legal current now is that we don't consider that copying, mm-hmm. if, if you're not actually physically porting a copy of it. That's often safe, but what I'm talking about is a little deeper than just whether it's copyright infringement or not. It's linking it, because even if it's legally safe, a clever lawyer is going to say, 
Well, we still think it's confident to come up with 500 reasons that the current trends were incorrect. And the Copyright Act. The Copyright Act makes change. They made change for a team of it. This is the Copyright Act number in 1976, and it was barely caught up to what was going on in 1976, and it certainly hasn't caught up to what's going on now. There will probably be, and the current wisdom is there will be a further amendment to the Copyright Act to deal with that very question, because it's the, the legal current is one thing, the actual statute is something else in terms of what the, what mm -hmm. a good members of Congress will actually say it should be in or does mean. So just you know, you have to be careful with it. But terms of use, the terms of use PC thing is also like if you're hosting your own podcast, I was saying to the panel before we started, some of these websites, not Facebook, but some of these websites will say anything you post we own. That's crazy. But you're signing on. When you sign on in terms of use, there's consideration, a contract-based a contract consideration. You're, the consideration you're given is the ability to use the site. If their terms of use say we own what you just posted, then let's say you have an agreement for use of what you just posted with the producer that says, I, Joe, producer, have the exclusive right to do X, Y, and Z with this musical, including the songs in this musical. You suddenly breach that agreement. Whether there's harm or not, who cares? I'm just a lawyer telling you that's a breach of an agreement. That's not a good thing to do. But even more perverse is a lot of these sites change their term and say, well, we don't own what you've done. Of course, you own you know, your intellectual property. You're telling us you have the right to put it on here. But we have a non-exclusive to license to use it and to authorize others the right to use it. You still have the same legal problem, which is if you've given Joe Producer exclusive rights to something, you can't give someone else non-exclusive rights. So you've got to be careful with that. And the other thing, before I put you all to sleep with the scary parts of this, <laughs> is in the entertainment world, there are often provisions in contracts. The theater business has been kind of immune to this, but not always. And though there are often confidentiality provisions that carry with them a no right to publicize. That they actually say to you creatively, as long as Joe Producer has the rights to this play, Joe Producer, and it would be a very specific clause, Joe Producer controls what happens with the show, including publicity for it. It is wisest best to always know before you start talking about your own show if it's being if it's under auction to start publicizing your stuff because you can get a ticked off producer, and that just leads to a bad relationship mm -hmm. where that leads to a producer that says I'm not interested in doing this anymore. There are dozens of things like that can happen. So you know it's easy for me to say like read read read, but I encourage you read the terms of use on any social networking site you use, and you'll be surprised by some of them, what they say they can do. And you know, you're reading them, you know, Facebook uses people in these sponsored ads, and they make ad dollars off of people. They make ad dollars off of me, and then it's like, that's, guess what? I signed the same terms of use. They have the right to do it. So you just have to know what you're dealing with, and I think that helps you, you know, if you do that first, maybe people should start saying, and I've started saying to producers, we need a carve out for the fact that they may have incidental bits from the show on their Facebook page, or they might have had it before, and there, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe it's not a real issue. Where it becomes a real issue is later down the line, like let's say the show gets optioned to be a motion picture. Who really cares about it are motion picture producers. Because that's a world of like, you show me everything you've ever done with this, and show me that you've always controlled it, that no other person has ever had a license for this, and if you have that up on a social networking site, maybe it doesn't matter, and most people will reject the show because of course it's on Facebook, that's how I found them. But just know what you've done with something. And it's tedious and it's boring and it's awful, but it's important. Do, do you, um, the, the authors of Nailed, do you, do you take some precaution when you're putting your own stuff online? Do you try not to put clips? I am, um, you know, I'm always curious because I there's no good way of sharing music in a playlist form. I've always wondered about, I guess it's because of Napster and things like that, that they just make it as hard as they can for you to share your iTunes playlist with, with another person over the internet. Um, <clears throat> and so I've always wondered, like, well, how, I, I've been doing a lot of work with Disney, and, and so I can't share it anyway, but, and I don't really want to share my stuff before it gets seen, but, but for when I do, like, is there any other way to share music and and I found this thing called SoundCloud and there was something about filling out the application that just made me kind of smell like <laughs> they own they own this they're going to own everything I put on it right so 
article. I just I didn't even read it. I gotta read. It. I guess I gotta read it. Is anybody? So I don't have to read it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's okay. So I can always. Right. They don't And I use Dropbox because that's a convenient way of sharing stuff with. But it's not that convenient for ordering a track list. You you can't. You have to like go in and rename every file. O one, O two, tickets. Um, so you kind of want to just be able to like line up a Dropbox track list. Doesn't even support What's that? Dropbox. No, Dropbox doesn't. Support well, I didn't even read it, so I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think you should start reading. I think you should start reading it. Right, Mark? Read, read, read. It's a private thing, and I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But it's hard to share things privately too. Yeah, I mean that and that's one of the things we talked about briefly when, when we spoke was was overexposure and just throwing too much out there. And, and maybe maybe some of these sites puts you in that po- puts you in that position because you you put too much out there and you can never get it back. Um, do you want to talk yeah, a little bit about I think, that? Yeah, I think I think for you know on my side of things, the idea is basically to sell the work you know on behalf of the author. Um, so we want to be very careful in terms of if if everyone has read it and everyone has an opinion on it and people have posted about it. Um, you know, you're gonna maybe run into a situation where somebody didn't read it because they can just Google it and here are the 30 different responses from other people. Oh, I, always, I can get the copy to play without ever having to get in touch with the author or the author's representative. So I can kind of take my time and read it and develop my own opinion without really having to respond or, or, or um, doing anything official with it. So that's where you wanna be careful, I think. I mean, I advise all of my clients that if they're gonna put anything up, just be very basic. If it's a play, no more than 10 pages. I think, you know, if, if people want to read 10 pages, that's fine. There's nothing that can be proven about there. Mm-hmm. Um, and to make sure, you know, if you've got a website, if people are interested, that's, I mean, I am not one uh, to understand Twitter too much, but if for some reason you were able to get something on other social media snippets, yeah. and then also <laughs> allow them to contact you and say, look, if you really liked this, let me know, because in general, people are, you know, if you can then be a judge of the character and say, I'm happy to send you this play, happy to send you these songs, but on an individual level, much like you were saying about with Dropbox, that it's one-on-one. This is kind of putting it out there, because once it's out there, it's out there. You know, there are obviously copyright laws, you know, but it's um, it's hard to get it back at that point. Um, and similarly with music, too, I think, you know, I'm sure some people have heard it, but I, I think it's, uh, it's important, particularly if you're writing a musical, that you're able to give people an understanding of what the tone is and what the aesthetic is. Um, but if you're putting whole songs out there, then someone can go, I like that melody. Let me just click that. And we don't want we don't want to do that. Putting snippets, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. You had an interesting thing with the Book of Mormon um, because it, it became this kind of point of contention. Um, the producers wanted the cast album uh, up streaming on Facebook all the time on the Facebook page. And um, and my p- and I really didn't have a p- I didn't have an opinion about it because I thought well their their argument was well it drives people to come see the show it's something people can share easily blah 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 and um, and my music publisher said that's cutting in and the and the record company um, said that's cutting into our business um, take it off or just stream part of them or just stream a few songs or whatever and. Um, and so, and but the producers didn't want to take it off, didn't want to take it off, and then eventually, um, eventually they said, okay, we'll try it. We'll just take it off for for a little while. And um, as soon as they took it off, the record sales jumped. They spiked mm-hmm. considerably. Oh, so it was weird. Like usually you hear like that's don't worry about that stuff. Just let things be out there. In this case, it seemed to it, there might have been some other factor, but it seemed to. It seemed to receive a bump from making it a little less accessible. Well, I think the other factor, and this is where the fine line comes in, and why this is an interesting tip of being a producer if you're trying to get people to hear something for the first time, um, is the word of mouth. Now yeah. people have heard it. You know, it's almost the idea of giving it out for free momentarily and paying it back. Yeah. And it's like, what happened? Okay, I guess I have to go buy it now. Yeah. Um, but if no one knows about the show or you're just trying to publicize yourself, I think it's a little bit more difficult to kind of express that. There's actually a, a different way that I've used social media. Actually, I've realized that um, the one 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 cool thing to do and uh, um, is is to just use it as a way of contacting people you're fans of. I I I um, mm-hmm. my daughter fell in love with the show Phineas and Ferb. I don't know if you've ever seen it on the Disney Channel, and, and I got to be a fan of it too. And 
I saw that the guys who created it were on Facebook, and I just kind of, you know, sent a message blindly saying, like, wow, I'm such a big fan, blah, blah, blah. And, like, within a month, the, I was in a room with them working on a song for Phineas and Ferb that I just <laughs> took, took the kick. But it was, it was, it was, and I realized, like, that, that thing works somehow, like, maybe it just takes the place of leaving their house and going to parties and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, for people, I, I don't like to, I wouldn't have, in the age of, of leaving your house and going to parties, I probably wouldn't have been as connected because I don't like to do that as much. And I, I do like to sort of connect. I think that the way to like kind of go overarching ab around this is to say, if you focus less on putting your work out there and more about putting you out there, you'll get a lot further. Like like what you did about reaching out, like that happens all the time. Yeah. I mean, we, we have members come up to us and say, I found myself into a workshop, into a production because I followed a certain artistic director on, on Twitter and they were tweeting all this stuff about recipes, and we actually exchanged like gumbo recipes or whatever. <laughs> and and a few weeks later, they contacted me and said, you know, oh, I s saw that you're a playwright. I'd love to read some of your work. So I think that it's less about putting. You tell me if I'm wrong. No, no. I, I think, think it's less about putting your work out there in, in people's face all the time as it is putting yourself. And I think so. that's the that's brilliant, honestly. And I think that's correct because it is taking the place of like you said, you know, going to a cocktail party. You're you're able to interact with these people in another setting. Um, you know, what I was more pointing out on a separate note, and I think that I am a little bit wrong, so, um, but the idea is that you're, you know, if, you, if you're going to use Twitter or anything like an e-blast, like, that's the place to do it, and that's the way to reach out to people for that kind of thing versus through your own website or a blog or traffic that you have. So that was the distinction there, but in terms of, yeah, using it as a, you know, you, are, you have ideally several pieces of work. Um, so you're selling yourself, so to speak, and interacting with people just like you'd interact with them anywhere else. Um, and, you know, being a part of, as we've said a couple of different times, the community. You know, there is the theatrical <coughs> community, and then there's the theatrical community on Twitter, and the theatrical community on Facebook. And it's making sure that you're a part of all of those and participating in, you know, serious discussions and also gumbo recipes. So yeah, this could be serious. Uh, <laughs> it's also, I, I feel like both Facebook and Twitter are not that useful for actually saying, I have this show going on, right. um, which is not a reason not to do it, because you'll get a certain number of people knowing about it. But also, I, I, feel like, I feel like actually the best way is to put something in someone's um, mailbox, is you just have to email, you just have to build up an email list and, and send out your, and invite people personally. Um, if you want them to come, because people are inundated by stuff on Facebook, people are inundated by stuff on Twitter. Um, it's just it, and and it's changed even since the beginning of Twitter. Like a, a few years ago, it was completely different than it is now in terms of like the amount of stuff that actually gets through. Um, which is maybe it's also the number of people that are on there now. But every day is just more and more. So I wanted to talk a little bit about. We were talking about releasing our material out into the world, uh, and to what extent it is the author's responsibility to go out there and, and, and check that these just are beliefs that people aren't you know, taking snippets or, or using songs um, in any way. And do any of you do that uh, as a matter of course? Is that something that just you deal with if it, if it comes up and then you tell Mark? Or, or you know, how, how do you do any of, of that sort of self Regulating, or are you pretty open? I mean, I, I personally have only, I haven't had a lot of um, productions or plays that that weren't licensed. I think I, I knew about, I found out about one recently and just got in touch with my publisher and was like, check this out and make sure that they paid for this because I never saw, I never saw it listed anywhere, but I, but I know it's on there. And you can do that. You can just search for your own stuff out there and, and, pre and see if it's being done somewhere. And either if it's not published, contact the person yourself and hope you get somewhere. But I mean, the only thing you can do is like get the drama to go to one of those bad schools that go there. <laughs> Which, I mean, that's yeah. not nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. MTI, I think MTI is always um, uh, the Muse Theater International is out there guarding their clients copyrights and I, I'm sure they use the internet as a way of policing it. Does, does the fair use standard change on the internet at all? I think it, I, I mean I think what becomes interesting is I mean a, as a basic matter of being a copyright owner when the MTI comes 
your best. That's a good example. You as a copyright owner, you have a lot of responsibility. You own something, and part of ownership is that you have to maintain that copyright, right? And part of maintaining copyright is that if someone's infringing it, you have an obligation in order to make sure you have the strength of the copyright law behind you to stop infringing, or if you're not stopping them, to give them a license, like to do a license after the fact. Because if there's repeated infringement and you've done nothing about it, and suddenly you target someone, let's say, you know, just for example, like, well, this, this person's infringing a Pokemon that I've not been marked in and made them stop, if you get involved in a legal battle, if you have a history of never enforcing your copyright, and suddenly you're just selectively enforcing it, it weakens your argument. It doesn't mean that you've lost your copyright. It actually weakens your argument as to how much you value that copyright. It could go into a damages calculation. It could go into whether you have the, the strongest thing a copyright owner have is the is a right to injunctive relief. We all know what that means mm -hmm. is the right to stop them, to shut them down. And the standard for injunctive relief is that you have to show that there is no other way, that monetary damages would not be sufficient to stop this wrong, to cure this wrong. And the ability to get injunctive relief, if you have a track record of and the other side's going to say, but there were 30 other productions, 30 other people did this over the course of five years, and suddenly they picked us. And we know, because of things like Google alerts and everything else, that they must have known this was going on. So why would suddenly you, judge, issue an injunction to stop us if they're just sort of picking their battles? And the only reason they're picking us is because we have a deep pocket and they, we feel like they want to pay on it. You don't want to deal with that. But you do have an obligation to police that. If you have a licensing agent like NPI, part of the licensing agent's job, much like a music publisher's job, is to enforce copyright on behalf of their clients, right? So you may have someone to do that. That's not the reality for everyone. So the idea of, I wrote this great play, I want people to know about it, so I'm going to post it serialized post it on the Facebook. Like, I'm going to every day post a scene from it. We talk about the issue with Facebook and there being possibly a non-exclusive license going on. You've also basically given the gift to the world for free, which is that someone may say, that's a great idea for a play. I'm going to write my own play that's like that. That probably, depending on the amount of the taking, what they're copying, is a classic example of fair use. We accept fair use. We're inspired by fair use. Fair use is a fairly good thing, except when you're the person <laughs> who has discovered that, oh, who liked this was someone that was actually connected enough with the producer that they wrote a different enough play that I don't have any recourse except to say to myself, I will never post my entire work on Facebook again. But you've done something really that's irreparable. You've sacrificed the fact, because now, if you send your play around, everyone's going to say, there's already, that's exactly like this other play that's being produced. You, you do yourself a disservice. So fair use kind of comes into it. It more just gets to the point that it's like, why would you share that much? Like, a great thing about being an artist is that you can selectively share. And the great thing about social networking sites is you're marketing yourself. If someone, if someone likes you, if someone's interested in who you are, and you open that door and say, I have this treasure trove of things that I've created. You've done, I think, what social networking is really for. You've done what Gypsy Rose Lee taught people. Show them a little bit of me, right? Like, you just <laughs> give them enough, right? Like, you give, you give them enough to bring them in, and that's how you develop a relationship. It's a weird thing because it's not, you know, because then you do go to a cocktail party, and now everyone stands around sort of like, what are we doing here? <laughs> How do I talk to other people without them shaming us? Oh, so that thing you're posting on Facebook—that's yeah. what it is. That's what the talk is. So, so that you know, so you just have to be smart about how you're using it. Trust me, I don't want to read your play on Facebook. I would never read it, but somebody devious might read it yeah. and take it for their own. That's what you've got to be careful about. You, it's you're not really going to find a producer by posting your play on Facebook. I'll just be totally crazy <laughs> and say that that's probably going to happen one time in someone's life. I mean, it, it just, it's not the way it works. So just be smart about how you're using it. And, and also for, for people posting, we talk about a lot about people, you know, their own material, putting their own material up. What happens when somebody posts material on your site or you're drawing from other sources? What sort of permissions 
sort of did you need in that context? I mean, that's, that's a fairly complicated question, and I want to sort of not really give specific legal advice mm -hmm. <laughs> being bright. I mean, here's the basic rule. If it's someone else's and you want to put it on your own website, you better think long and hard before you do it. If it's a matter of it was a news story, like that's fairly safe zone in terms of like that was reported, that was something else, that's probably okay to make sure. But here's the distinction. If it's your website, bottom line, if you're posting someone else's intellectual property on your website, you have a lot of liability for that. If you're linking through, if you're if it's on someone else's site, or it's on the news organization's site, or it's on the original playwright's site, or it's on, you know, it's coming from the original source material, and you're linking through, you're probably okay. Because linking through, again, isn't copyright. But I would encourage you to really think twice before you do any of that. Because the, the, the minute you're taking something that isn't yours, if you don't have this general feeling of kind of, I should be doing this, you're not thinking. And you need to think before you do something. So someone else's work, we have great laws in this country that allow for fair use, that allow for commentary, that allow for things that make it okay. But let a lawyer do that work for you. And I'm not plugging like hire me, but that is, that is what a lawyer's job is. Because a lawyer's job is to take you to the edge without pushing you over it, to give you the basic guidance you need in terms of like, that's okay. There's always risk involved in what you do. But when you're dealing with other people's intellectual property, think the same thing. Would you want them not doing that to you? Would you want to see your work on someone else's site? And even if a lawyer eventually tells you that's okay, and I've had to tell a number of clients that's okay, <coughs> that's fair use. We allow that. That that's how we function. If you have that feeling about your own work, think about what the other person is doing. And again, it goes back to that respect issue. Maybe what you want to do is if you don't know and you can't afford a lawyer, ask the person whose work you're taking, would you mind if I quote you on my website? Again, you're marketing yourself, you're making a connection, you're skipping the cocktail party and just getting to the gumbo <laughs> recipe. I mean, like, you, know, you, you can do that and it's okay. And that's another great thing about social media because you're not on hold waiting for something forever. You're sending the message, right? Whether it's responsive or another thing, but listen, it's, a, it's an easy way to connect with people and it's an easy way to ask permission. Reviews are different because that is that falls well within why we have the First Amendment. That's commentary. Mm -hmm. Reviews are commentary. Um, if you aren't a member of a news organization and you're providing commentary, there might be a little pushback in terms of whether you're quoting extensively of what is in the play <laughs> or using production photos or something else. That may be an issue. I don't think ultimately it's a winning, something you have a lot to worry about. But again, it's just a matter of like what you're taking. Reviews are always safe because reviews, that's what we want. That's how we, that's how we sort of further the arts. And interviews the same thing. Interviews the same thing. I mean, with an interview, especially if you're going to put it on a website, you're going to want the person to sign even a basic release because a lot of times interviewees may think, oh, they told me it was just going to be on this little website and suddenly it's on Facebook and suddenly it's on someone else's website. It expands the, the basic contract you enter into with the person. So you want some sort of release that says, I may use this, I may give others the right to reprint this, I, ha I own it forever. It's just a good practice to get into because what may happen with an interview later is maybe you're a playwright who works like Anna Devere Smith or works like a playwright who builds things based on interviews and you may not have the rights to use that interview. So it's a, it's a good and practice to get into. Playwright, right? if, you're if, playwright. You, if you are being interviewed, yeah. like if you're the subject, Again, that's generally safe, but again, have you entered into any other contracts that may say you can't do that? Do you have any contractual restrictions <coughs> on doing it? Probably not, but it just you know sort of connects the dots in that regard. Adam, have you run into any of that in your? Blogging? I've never asked anyone to to sign anything, really? um, which probably will be a problem if I try to publish it, because that'll have the kind of context you can yeah. give to a playwright and be like, "Hey, <laughs> you want to sign a release?" <laughs> <laughs> which could be time consuming, which is partially why there isn't a book, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's another issue, time. I mean, how much time do you spend? She works until the book. I mean, how much time do you, do you respond to every tweet? Do you go on there every, every 10 minutes? I mean, what, what's the I mean, time requirement suck, on it, this? It's not hard to suck your whole day away just uh -huh. talking to people on the internet. 
But you, um, can, you can be really smart about it. Can you use like Tell me about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> like okay, so like there are some like dashboards that you can use, like uh, Hootsuite or TweetDeck. It kind of like loads all of your social media into one place. Like I have Hootsuite cool. in front of me right now, and so I can see anyone that's tweeting with the new play hashtag. Um, and then as, if down. anyone has mentioned the Drama Skilled, um, so on and so forth, down the line. Has anyone tweeted? Yeah, we actually have a couple <laughs> questions that we'll get to um, at the Q&A. Um, so like it kind of collects all of these things into one place. So rather than going to Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all these other places, you kind of get one skim across. And it's incredibly helpful. Yeah. What is it called? Uh, so there's TweetDeck and then there's Hootsuite. Hoot, Hootsuite, like an owl. Um, do you ever use Tweety? T H E E D. I don't, but I've heard a lot of people yeah. using Tweety. Yeah. I mean, okay, so do then the Bobby, <laughs> I I wait, I wait so then time. like so then the other part of this is like how you gather information, because uh, part of being in social media is that you can learn from it, right? So like Google alerts are like my live or die by. I have a. Uh, you really work in this department. I know. Well, I'm still getting them, but they're not as good. They're not as good. Yeah, the searches aren't as good. <laughs> Um, there's a, another thing called Twitlert that is like Google Alerts for Twitter. So you can you can put in like a, if you want to put, yeah, oh yeah, these are all my like my favorites. I'm addicted. Um, so like you put in like um, submission opportunities in Twitlert, and then every day you get an alert that that has been mentioned on Twitter. So it kind of does the work for you. So you don't have to keep go through everything. And then the other thing that like I am it is my morning routine now. It's called Paper Li. And it's kind of like your own newspaper in the morning. Yeah, yeah. And like more and more people are doing it, and then they're tweeting out like their daily newspaper, which is useful, I guess. But like I like the work being done for me, like bring it to me. So you put in like the news source or like the person that you want to follow or the search term, and it collects it all for you and then delivers it neatly to your uh, inbox in the morning or evening, whatever time of day you want it. But then you can publish that to other people, right? Then, yeah, right. Then so like. It collects all of these articles, and then you can go through and pull what you don't like and keep what you do like, and then you can put that out onto social media. So it's this kind of big bundle of information. So anything that will do the work for you is good. So. Wow, that's wonderful. <laughs> uh, I think we are ready to open it up to a few questions. But before we do, maybe we could just go down the line. And if everyone just gave their one piece of advice, whether it be don't do this, or I love Hootsuite, is that Hootsuite, whatever it was, <laughs> <laughs> you'll tell us again. Just just go down down the line and just give us our, our, our one takeaway, and then we'll, we'll open it up to some questions from the room. Mine's repetitive. Just read terms of use. Just know what you're doing. Uh, mine would be uh, use the internet to make friends. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say don't put whole bodies of work on the internet. Mm. I would say tr treat social media like you would anything else, like anything in real life. Any, like t treat it the same way. Still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, do some Q&A, I don't know. Yes, we can do some Q&A if, if you come up with anything. <laughs> raise your hand, sure. Okay, um, I have actually a couple of questions. <coughs> if that thing is not just uh, what you say, let's say this is done, on a site or on Facebook or something like that. I mean, I, I personally, I think it's a good idea. Um, I don't, I mean, anyone could always steal anything, mm -hmm. like at any point in the process. It, it's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't happen a lot. It does occasionally happen. Mm -hmm. But I feel like if, if it, putting a synopsis on your website uh, it's probably a better idea than on Facebook, but or you could even put it on Facebook if that's if that's the only thing you have. Mm -hmm. um, but I would, if I if I were you, I would put it I would put it on your own website, um, and then you know I guess there wouldn't be the fear of Facebook owning it. Right. Yeah, but then you wouldn't get as much traffic to it. Well, well you could link to it from the you say here's the link to my website, and then people will click your website. In fact, I think there's actually an option that on your Facebook page it's like name website and which one of those links you want to see there for everyone to see constantly. Right. My other question is a follow-up to that is what about YouTube? Do you expect from a site that you're presenting or that's being presented for you or something like that? Is there a couple of clicks you need to Well there's run in, you might run into equity problems with that. Um, in terms like if you're using equity actors, um, I it depends. Oh, what I've had um, for plays, especially recently, is 
they do a sort of short film that, that gives kind of the tone of the play, mm -hmm. but doesn't have any of the text of the play in it whatsoever. And those were really successful, I think, in getting attention to the play. Um, and actually, we didn't even use the actors that were in the play, but it was the world of the play that we were trying to get across. Um, in, in my case, I'm talking about, I had this play Clown Bar, mm -hmm. and we had like these short um, films of like basically violent clown things happening. Mm -hmm. um, and they were really, um, really well done, and I think they got people excited about it but like are not directly related in such a way. And that's sort of how we get around some of the union issues right now. Um, so or, to talk about it. You know, right, or act, you get the actors to talk about something else or talk about what they like about the play or that kind of thing instead of actually reading lines from the play um, if they need to. The, the, the issue you run into is, think about everything that's copyrightable in a play, sets, costumes, lighting design, the play itself, direction, everything you're doing. So to truly be able to do that, you need consent from every single one of those persons for what you're doing. I'm also a real purist when it comes to theater. And the thing I think you need to be careful about is watching a digital version of a play is very different than sitting in an audience seeing it. And it could very well send the wrong message. And that's easy to say for audience members or people like ephemerally sort of just like experiencing it. And maybe that's the only, you know, there's arguments on both sides of it. What I fear about from the lawyer's point of view is that if you have a play that someone sees and then says to someone, oh, look at this, there's a link up to it on YouTube, it's really good, you're a motion picture producer, take a look at it. You could actually be doing a couple things, which is that it's already out there for the world to see. The beauty of theater is that it's sort of like it's a safe environment for many people that, that you know, it, it kind of feels elitist, but it's a special thing that, you know, you pay admission, you go, you sit, and you experience something that's more than just what's happening on the stage. You're actually having a community experience. But if you do something like that, think of the bundle of sticks that's involved in what you've written. There's motion picture opportunities, television opportunities, there's sequels, there's pre there's everything you can do with what you own. You could make a very bad decision and decide like, oh, because I really like this production and I sort of want to spread the word, I want to put it on the internet. That could break a lot of those sticks for you. Right. You know, it could, it could sort of send the wrong message about the play itself or other things that the play could be. So there's just reasons to be savvy about, you know, if you have a reason to do it, that's one thing. But just to do it, I think, it, again, it's just thinking about what, why you want to do I've, I've noticed that uh, musical theater writers, I don't do this, but, but most young musical theater writers have a, c a collection of clips on YouTube um, with equity actors doing their stuff in cabaret form, and I guess they get away with that because of small rights and it's not really That's a right. play. Yeah. I, I mean, always thought like, like playwrights should yeah, have an evening of monologue. Of it's cabaret. tricky because it, unless you really have someone who's very good with the camera, unless you really know what you're doing, it's almost always going to look terrible. And yeah. that's kind of the unfortunate mm -hmm. truth but, about but it. But watch 10,000 of them and you kind of get learn to see through it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, lot. you cast the whole Book of Mormon workshop from looking at people's YouTube oh, really? wow. clips. Oh, yeah. 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 Really? I, think for, I think for that, that's actually a really good point, that you can actually get deeper into the talent pool. That's a very positive use of it. My fear is like actually taking your own play and sort of just like throwing up what you've presented in the theater. It's different to have people sort of singing kind of in that cabaret context songs because that kind of, that again is marketing yourself, not necessarily marketing one piece. And it's also a really good tool to use for talent because you may find talent that way or that talent goes on to do something else. That's also part of like, you know, why we're in this bizarre community, right? Like it's a, it's a sharing sort of experience. So I think that's a positive. I think that cabaret situation works too. I mean, you mentioned set designers like Lennox and stuff like that. If it's a space where they're not bringing in a designer for everything, the mm -hmm. space's agreement usually is, you know, we're going to bring everything together. You have the right to tape it. Mm -hmm. The actor will sign off on it in most cases, but are happy to because, as we discussed, they can get cash from that snippet. Mm -hmm. um, and because, as a composer, there's a, I mean, somebody agrees with any of this, there's, um, you own the actual music, so you're, you're happy to put it up there. But it doesn't actually necessarily tell the whole story. It doesn't necessarily, it's a portion that goes along with the whole Yeah, and plus, act. because it's such a poor quality video, it's really not cutting into anybody's enjoyment of it. It doesn't, it doesn't eat away at the, the live experience or the, you know, even the cast album because it's got background noise or whatever. It's just not, it's not such a great experience, but it does get it out there. I tend to not enjoy the final product of the musical because I watch the wrong musical. <laughs> or I'm, I'm expecting.
shows us is Dave Chappelle Albert. Mm-hmm. Watch our video mm-hmm. about our show with Dave Chappelle yeah. Albert on their company's website. And I'm like, really? I don't That's why we don't do that anymore. Yeah. I was like, wow. I don't. I have seen enough. I don't need a second one of show. I can go through this now. I've seen enough. I know what it's going to be about. And, it's, and so I, I feel like I would not want my show to be even professionally as the Broadway show is a professionally video show. Yeah. So far, I've not seen one that made me want to go see the show. Mm-hmm. Or I feel like I've seen enough of the show now. I don't need to spend the money, and it's fine. I, I just have one last thing. I had a show growing up at the Wood Town International Theater Festival this summer. The um, musical, called, right? No, it's not a musical. Okay. Um, it's called Yesterday Iran, Today Iraq, it's a drama, and I hope you will all come to it. It's July 24th, 25th, and 26th, and that's my part to admit. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask Bobby a quick question. I'm still trying to feel my way on Facebook. Um, forget t- Twitter, that would be some time in the future. <laughs> but when you uh, got the response from the producers for that kids, for the kids show, yeah. do you, do you, did you put that on your um Facebook page that you like the show, or did you go and seek their Facebook? I guess I had on their wall or something. I, what I did was I I guess I was a direct message. I direct messaged the guy. He hadn't blocked people from. He happened to be on Facebook and was kind of open. I don't think we were friends yet, but I just sent him a direct message saying. Are you talking about Phineas and Ferb? Phineas and Ferb, yeah, yeah. Um, but I had also put fan stuff, uh, you know. I tweeted like I mean I I put on Facebook I think the show is the greatest thing I love it if I'm becoming a crazy fan I tried to do the same thing with um, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic (laughs) 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 which is pretty awesome too but I haven't heard back from them (laughs) you'll probably see this though (laughs) 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 Twitter question well yeah so uh, so there is there's a couple Um, I guess it goes back to how do you get people to actually, so when you're starting out on Twitter, how do you actually, get, or Facebook or anything, how do you get people to actually care about what you're putting out? So do you have any tips about, like. Put out something that people care about. Which, okay. That's I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It, it kind of depends on what you're interested in, but but talk about what you're interested in. If you if that's what you want to spend your time doing, then you know spend your time talking about what you're interested in, and then find the other people who are interested in that. I, I notice there's a there's there are narratives going on all the time in, on the internet that the internet is kind of like a, a cauldron of you know people are talking about a certain thing a lot and if you can attach frame what you're what you want to talk about in terms of, of the news of the day or the whatever the, the narrative of the day it, it gets a lot more traffic it gets a lot more links mm-hmm. and stuff so I, that's I don't really like doing that but you notice that do you spell something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And then just like one someone's th- name wrong, <laughs> you'll get a one-star answer. <laughs> uh, then the other question is, um, how does the panel feel about tweet seeds? What is that? Mm-hmm. You know, you, really? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We're going to skip the question. <laughs> <laughs> certain certain theaters uh, allow oh, a section yeah. for uh, yeah. on Twitter and yeah. your screen. Oh, so. Was that like in Smash where they decided to put it? Then the yeah. that was. The I mean, it's distracting. Weird. Like, if you're in the dark watching the play, it's really distracting to have even one person in one screen with it. Mm-hmm. Right. So that, I mean, if that was my play, I would, I would hate it. Unless, like, somehow the lights are on the audience, but that's also horrible. They right. don't have an effect on it, so they all tweet together. Oh, really? Yeah, they, oh. they throw their name off, like the team effect. Oh, well, that's a good way. But, but I don't see how those yes. people can actually be involved in the play, because the whole point of theater is to group yourself in the right. show. Right, yeah. You put yourself yeah. out there, and how can you do that and I think that's part of it. I mean, I don't want to step no, in, but no. I think part of it is too that you know we're all on this panel kind of discussing what is all of this stuff and how do we use it. I think that you know production companies. I, I was at a Yankees game over the weekend and they had on the you know tweet and maybe we'll win a free T-shirt and people are starting to play with it and figure out exactly what it is. So I mean, to answer the question, how I feel about it personally is I think it's interesting and we can see if something comes of it. But I also think you're right in that. Well, then the person telling you it's a play. So yeah. then what's the idea behind it? But you know, I think it's important to kind of push the boundaries and see what we can do with the social media. Because um, if we just say no, then that's just not worth it. Yeah. You can't take the drive. If you, you, know, if you read the uh, the technology issue of the dramatists, like there are a few articles in there where they talk about you know how they're using social media for the show. So I think that there's a case to be made that there are smart ways to really integrate it. But I think that like personally, for me, for me, is like. 
you know, there necessarily there isn't necessarily a, a, a tweet seeds for like Virginia Woolf doesn't seem as fitting as like a new play where they <laughs> thought about it when they were writing it. It's like you know the character was going to tweet to you, you know, so you get both sides of it. You know, there's a smart way and then there's a not smart way. So well, because the foot, like it, it's interesting because you like the the footage from the musical show doesn't work for you. It doesn't draw you in. It right? turned me off. So it's so you, so here's the issue. Like how do we how do we market this industry to people that generally don't go to theater, right? Like 20-somethings, theater's not for them. It's, it's what grandma and grandpa did for them. For me, it was what mom and dad did, and blessed be I like theater. I mean, there, there has to be a way to sort of figure this out for people. The industry does fine, but it's not gonna do fine forever, because if, if 20-somethings aren't going to play, or if they're only going to you know, maybe an American Idiot or maybe Rent, they're not getting the reason that theater exists, right? That there's a broader reason for it. So. Yeah, like maybe it doesn't work at Virginia Woolf, but could it work one night a week at Virginia Woolf? Or could it work during intermission? Or, you know what I mean? There's, there, there's a way to do it, and I think this sort of like, mar marketing is about sort of that broad stroke, how do we how do we find the target, right? So there, there has to be a way to do it. Personally, I would be irritated if I saw a growing section of the theater tweeting during the show. I would be appalled. Like it, it would be literally appalling to me. I like but the intermission idea. The, you know, there's, there's things I'm just saying, like, you know, but the only way to find that out is to, for us to be saying, like, would I mind an intermission? I'd be irritated, because I'd be thinking I want to talk to the person I'm with, but I'd look at people and say, hey, if there's a way to market this, and it's it's free, you know what I mean? Like, it's a, it's an easy thing to do. It, it, it can happen both ways. I mean, if, if one is putting up a web title, can you do a dark touch on uh, tags that would help the site come up in the first sentence? And the second question is, no one is making a drink here. <laughs> you it? I mean, I'm on it, but I never go there, ever. Uh, the only time I go there is when people request me, and then like once a week or so I'll go on and say yes, 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 and then I leave. LinkedIn's great for like full contact info or like a bit more depth of sort of who this person is. I think that it's become sort of a joke of the social media world in terms of like LinkedIn, like it's just, yeah, and who cares, you know what I mean? It, I use it as a lawyer because it's easy for me to connect to other business people or to find people quickly. I feel weird about going to Facebook to find a professional. It feels strange to me as a lawyer. I feel like I'm invading someone's space. So I think it's good for that. It just it doesn't function the same way because there is there isn't the same amount of interactivity that I think that's more exciting about the other social media sites. But it's it's not really to necessarily endorse one type of thing over another. It's just sort of where the flow of of energy seems to be going. And this is probably going to change change all well, the time. Well, see, that's the thing. Yeah. Is great. I think it's great. Like, you know, you can find out who your friends I'm one link away from yeah. a director. You can go, do you know this guy? And you go, yeah, that's Frank. You know, I think it's really Blue important. Blue Jabari's assistant. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, think it's, I think it's good for that. I think the thing is that I don't think that younger people think of it the same way. And I don't want to keep saying it's only the younger people that matter. I think that because it feels more static, it feels more like a database that people don't use it the same way and it doesn't function the same way. Yeah, I mean, I thought the function of it was kind of to get jobs, mm -hmm. um, yeah. to, to connect with people in the industry. Isn't but I think, <laughs> what's that? Isn't that why we're all here? <laughs> but, but, I think that, but I think that most um, of the people are on, more of them are on Facebook than are on LinkedIn. So I think it's just like, that's, I would go to Facebook first and then I would search them, and then whatever pops up, either their, you know, LinkedIn might be might pop up if they don't have a website. Um, but I wouldn't go to LinkedIn first to find someone because probably they're more likely to be on Facebook. Like, uh, what was your first that. question? I forgot what your first <laughs> question was. I, I want to actually just help LinkedIn just for a second because I think <laughs> that, like it's not a complete waste. Like, LinkedIn is a great place to go for information. Like, if you have a question about a certain thing, like. So the Dramatist Guild has a LinkedIn group, and like there are people on it all day long asking questions about, you know, their experience at a certain theater or a certain region or what opportunities are out there. So I think that like it's great to house like one conversation, and not to say that Twitter and Facebook don't have those, but because of its professional kind of vibe, that's kind of to go to LinkedIn. That's kind of what you go there for. So that's, I'm just, I want to help LinkedIn. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 did, I did not mean to disparage it. My yawn was more like that's the reaction I hear from people. I do use LinkedIn, but I'm a lawyer, so it fits well within, you know, it's, it's sort of like that's, but that's I, what it is. I think that piggybacks on to what your other question was, which is the idea behind sort of getting people to your page. And 
uh, yeah. behind traffic. Um, you know, the idea behind LinkedIn versus Facebook, I feel like, is, you know, has been my proverbial niece. It's not talking about boys with their friends on it. It's, you know, <laughs> it's very much a professional environment. And I think there's, you know, depending on the sites, as you guys go out and, and experiment with some of them, they find the ones that work better for what you need it for. Um, but one of the reasons I think Facebook does so well is because uh, it, uh, it has so many different purposes. Um, so it allow, it drives more traffic through it, and therefore advertisers are there more, and more people are linking to it. So in terms of your question about linking to your page, the idea is to kind of put yourself in a position and in a place where people are going to see you the most. If your website is completely separate, it's not necessarily going to drive people. People aren't just going to Google your name and then go to your website. Now, that could happen, but the better way to go about it is to you know link to Facebook, link to and all sorts of other different sites, and the idea being that you know, Google and the spiders will crawl through every website all over the place and they'll keep getting driven back to your page. And the more that happens, the more they're able to drive traffic. I don't think there's a specific tag or anything, but it really is truly just, you know, going on Twitter and going on Facebook. And the longer you do it and the more times you're linking back to your page, the more people, the more ways that those spiders are going to find their way back to your page. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I feel like you're going to be a better so, way to handle it. So, well, look, I, I, uh, so here's the thing. There are plenty of people that would, would tell you that there is like an algorithm. There's like a, a formula to put in, your co uh, put in your website that makes you the top search. There are plenty of people that would tell you that. The truth is, every time someone figures that out, like Google, all the search engines have already gone around it so that they aren't like clogged with yeah. that code. So the way to go about you know, making your site active or making people come to your site is to make it active. Is to do exactly what you're saying and like link it out, share it. The the more that you update something, all of these are things that factor into whenever someone searches either your name or one of your play titles, that it is driven to your site as opposed to someone else's site. Does that make sense? It's almost like you're planting no. seeds. I mean, you're kind of just you're throwing out a link here and a link there, and then over time, the more people that go to that website and click on that link all of these search engines are going to see is people are clicking on that link and people are going to that site and it's all feeding back to you, to that original source that they go to that site. So the longer they're there and the more there are, the more traffic it's going to drive. But it's something that just takes time and takes a lot of action. But, but are you talking about blogs here? Or are you talking about... I mean, I'm just talking in general about like the SEO, like search uh -huh. engine optimization. Sure. Um, <laughs> but in terms of like, if in general, like the the old way of having a website, you you kind of put your information on it, mm -hmm. and then try to link to the other places where you are. Right. Um, but are you when you're saying put out links, are you saying have more and more and more links on that website, or are you saying have links from other locations to linking back to your website? I think in general, okay, so then just to make this like really, it's like, I think that the main thing is so that it looks really active, whether it's a blog or your website, to make it look active um, and m make the more traffic that is coming to your website, the better. So if it's updated regularly and if people are coming to it, so you get people to come to it by sharing it out through Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff, right? Um, another thing that you see on blogs are that people will, they'll write an article and then they'll link it and say, if you like this, then you might like this article because it, it applies. Or within the article, they'll say something about their last, um, their summer vacation, and then they'll link to that article. So I think that there's a way to kind of tie it together so that you can think that way. Two questions in one. You finish the promises here. Okay, <laughs> yes. Well, you can certainly go to it at any time and log in and post whatever you'd like to. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it's a relatively new feature of the website, so I do give it some credit on that. Okay. Um, look, the the goal. Well, let, you gotta no, 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 no. We got to drive some more traffic. No, no, no. <laughs> look, uh, the thing is this: from the guild standpoint, we wanted a place for guild members to be able to talk to one another in a secure place. And I think that the more that people do that, and the more people see it and get comfortable with it, the more that they will go to that place uh, to share information. So I think that it's in like its starting phases, and uh, I think that you'll see it kind of develop. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. And and you know the other thing is our website is is being worked on all the time, and we're trying to make it more user friendly and give you more through our website.
website. So I think in time you're really, listen, I don't want to drop any secrets, but in time you're going to fall in love with our website. <laughs> <laughs> somebody uses it and you find out about it, what should your steps be? Um, I, I had a play that came out on uh, Amazon, just came out. I have a um, <coughs> agent slash, slash promoter and he's going crazy with it already. It's like blowing my mind and it's like going out all over the place. And, and I'm thinking, what if somebody picks this up and they're using it, which is what I want, but then how do I catch up with, wait a minute, Supposed to tell, you're supposed to let me know that this is being produced or being done. Because I, I have all kinds of copyright stuff all over the uh, the play. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's allowed to use it unless they contact me and blah, blah, blah. Because Amazon just wants to sell the play. They're just There's selling no a printed version. Which is, it's not the producer. Yeah. I'm the one who wants to know if anybody's going to produce it. What do I do if somebody does produce it and how, how do I go after them? I just go to cease and desist. You can send a cease and desist letter. Or you could call Mark. Yeah. He'll be happy it's to help you, you. Your, your instinct is right. You tell them to stop. That's what cease and desist means. Mm -hmm. so or or that, pay me. Yeah. Or pay me if you want to do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, talk to the guild about this. Do you think that's a good idea to have some sort of self-publishing in mm -hmm. place if you have a long play? Or? I, I think it's different for everybody. I mean, I, I don't, you know, that we've talked generally about the dangers of it. I think it's a personal decision. I have clients that don't want to do that because they're very protective of it and they believe in the process of, you know, this, this is the right process for me, which is that it's a, it's a personal, private road to getting it produced the way I want to get it produced. Other people feel like it's a great way to get the information out there, to get people interested in that. It's just different for everybody. And there's dangers in both, right? Like the more you hold something close to you, it's a business decision. Maybe it's no one ever sees it or maybe it's never produced. And the opposite is that the whole world has it and it leads to this problem that people are producing it without a license. It, it, it's, a, it's a necessary part of the business model. It's just the, the way it works, and it just becomes a decision you have to make. Okay, I'll move back. Edward, do you have an Adam Powers that you can use? I forgot that. I'm sorry, not Adam, Max. Sorry. <laughs> oh, Max. Wow. <laughs> that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> Happened, but it's not that I w it couldn't happen. I guess um, you know I feel like a lot of a, a lot of agents and managers are in a position where they're getting recommendations from people that they have a relationship with already, um, and for reasons of keeping that relationship up, and also because you trust their taste, um, they usually kind of rise to like, okay, I need to read this now. Um, and when that happens quite a bit, it's harder to kind of go on a whim. Um, but I do think, particularly when I was getting started, and I think when I can. Those are the kinds of things that, if you if the interest is peaked, then yeah, why not? Why not give it a read? Why not see? I think you know you had a great example of just knowing these guys and saying, "Look, I own the show. I'd love to write with you," and it happens. So um, I don't know that it's the most common thing, but it is possible. Um, and uh, and I, I feel like people will listen if you just reach out to them. Okay. This brings it a little far afield, but podcast. Does anybody have anything soon that I'm sure what kind of technology you could use for what you think would be fun? Yeah, I just dealt with this, um, so I don't want to speak to it too, uh, too much because we're still figuring it out. Um, but it's an interesting, uh, there are actually a couple companies that are doing this now that are, are interested in broadcasting full versions of plays, like radio plays, and having them available for free. Um, and, you know, depending <coughs> on where you are and which exposure you need, the question is, uh, is it good for the writer or not? Mm -hmm. And what are the royalties? And the idea is with something like a podcast, um, most people are getting them through other organizations like Apple, logically, um, who have <coughs> reviews, which are rather complicated. Um, and even if the, the writer and the producer of the podcast have a great agreement, everyone's on the same page, it may not necessarily just be up to them. It, it has to do with the distributor and and who has access to that content. So um, I've been doing this quite a bit in terms of, you know, can it, can it be a podcast for a week and expire? Um, are there ways, can, 
the stream exactly? Can um, is there a way to manage who is streaming it and how, and to be able to remove it from computers? Can it be reported? So it's it's a complicated issue uh, and a good question, but I, I don't really know the answer. I, I think that I think this this goes back to the point earlier, like. The, the really good podcasts like I listen to on a daily basis are someone talking about yeah. like their work that like it's someone sharing like the yeah. five tips for better marketing or like you know yeah. the five tips of using social media so it isn't necessarily like putting your work out there it's again it's putting yourself out there I, I will say like you know the, the guild has the podcast series in the room mm -hmm. and it's all about writers talking about their craft and talking to each other about it and kind of building off of that mm -hmm. and it's been fairly successful and what technology do you use uh, we use, uh, it's all archived audio. Okay. So we have all of the literally reel-to-reels digitized, mm -hmm. and then we have the MP3, and then we edit that through GarageBand, and okay. then, um, it, you know, then it makes it up to our website and then through iTunes. Okay, great. Yeah, and I should be clear, I mean, podcasts, I think, are a good thing, particularly with this involvement, because I think you need the work itself to put an entire work on sure. is all very complicated. No, I mean, depending on what the comment is, you know, there, there might be, if, it, if it's just like, I enjoyed the song, great. I hated the song, fine. You're allowed to do that. It's, I can't really describe because it would be such a ridiculous situation. It, it would be saying, I listened to this song and I met this composer once and this composer had sex with a goat. I mean, it would have to be something, <laughs> I mean, it would have to be something You'd have to cross a line that I'm hoping no one in this room would ever <laughs> cross. It. So, you know, it, it's that kind of thing. It's going into sort of like the defamation range of things. You, we're allowed to comment on things. Let's just, we, we live in a great country when it comes to that. We're allowed to do that. It's when you cross a line. And again, I can't tell you what line you're going to cross because I don't know you. But, um, you know, so it, it just, you'd, you'd have to it, uh, just be mindful of what you're saying. On that note, thank you all for coming. Thank you.